Hey everyone, so today I'm going to talk about the most visible end gamers of Big Brother USA history, and I am including BB2 and BB3, since Endgame, in my opinion, starts from the final six onwards. Speaking of that, I did make a mistake with my last video, which was about the least visible jurors who didn't make it to the end game. I will correct that in the next video and go more in depth there. Anyways, these five are in the honorable mentions for visibility. I'm not shocked with most of them being from the older seasons, and the very few who were in the more recent seasons, which still were like a decade ago, don't surprise me much either. Might as well just get on with the list. So at 20th is Tyler from Big Brother 20, who has a diary room average of 7.58. Despite the bias against the newer seasons pertaining the distribution of diary rooms, I am not shocked that he barely made it on the list. It was clear to me that they wanted BB20 to center around him, and because it has been some years since we had a superfan mastermind, he was the perfect fit. Of course he lived up to this by controlling the entire season, and the distribution of the diary rooms went heavily into his favor. To the point that essentially everyone else who wasn't in his alliance weren't very visible. I feel like he got this much because they kind of had to, not because he was an interesting, witty, or a charismatic speaker, or a person, if that makes sense. Kind of a straddlebot. At 19th is Dan from Big Brother 10, who has a diary room average of 7.59. So, I knew that one of his renditions would make the list, but I didn't know which one would be placed on the list. It seemed like, to me, he was cast to be the superfan Stratobot from the beginning, and he definitely lived up to it, especially in the beginning, where he got a lot of diary rooms for weeks where he wasn't really relevant for in actuality. Of course, in the second half of the season, where he was able to solidify an alliance, he became the mastermind of the season and took the reins when him and Memphis walked over everyone, essentially. Of course, there was the roulette, which he created to make a good TV moment, and there was nothing or no one stopping him. At 18th is Yvette from Big Brother 6, who has a diary room average of 7.67. Not shocked at all that she ended up being on the list, but I did think that she would be a bit higher than she ended up being. Whether you like Yvette or not, she was a captivating personality with her random quips, emotional behavior, expressive personality, and vulnerability that most of her alliance and house guests in general just didn't have that season. Production relied on her a lot to narrate the events of the house, even if it didn't directly or involve her at all. She was used whenever they needed some levity or over-the-top behavior, and they chose to give her content, since she was never in power until the very end of the season, but she was the most visible from damn near the beginning. She was the most visible person on her season, and for good reason, in my opinion. At 17th is Marvin from Big Brother 5, who has a diary room average of 7.8. Looking at his time on the show, he would not only never be cast in a modern season of Big Brother, but he is also very unique compared to everyone else that was cast. He had a more sadistic sense of humor, but was not completely sarcastic, and you could tell that he was just being himself, when many others were clearly playing up their humor and words to the cameras. What makes Marvin a great narrator is that he didn't fill a specific role. He was also very game-savvy and portrayed his knowledge in the diary rooms well. He never needed to raise his voice or exaggerate his voice to make a point, and he had this relaxed vibe about him. Marvin also did get into his fair share of drama in the season, and we are able to see him trying to find out who he can trust in the game, but not catering to anyone either. At 16th is Hardy from Big Brother 2, who has a diary room average of 8.11. It was so clear that he was cast to be the Superman slash Clark Kent hunk of the cast, and he does fill that role a bit in the beginning, but that was also when he was at his least visible. There are moments where Hardy is generally like Clark Kent or Superman. He is intelligent, well-spoken, 
knows the right things to say, and can be gentlemanly as well as generous. But there are some other layers to him. He has anger issues, is obsessed with trying to be perceived as a hero, though he has a lot of selfish sides, and we watch him cave more and more towards it as the season goes on. He contributes to a lot of the strategy in this season, and was the biggest drama magnet overall in that season, so they went to him for that as well. And then he started having several breakdowns and meltdowns once it got closer to the end. I do think he benefited from being on an early season, but he deserved to be this high on the list overall. At 15th is Bunky from Big Brother 2, who has a diary room average of 8.13. It really is interesting to me that not only did Bunky make it on the list, but he was barely able to beat out Hardy on the list, especially because Bunky was not involved in the game dynamics until his final week in the house. Of course he benefited from being on a season that has a lot of diary rooms, but they still gave him a lot more content when they didn't have to. On the first season of Survivor, we see a friendship between a homophobic man and a homosexual man form, and the same thing happened here. I also think that Bunky not fitting into what the quote-unquote stereotypical gay man is, and we got to see his arc throughout the season of not being a wallflower or a follower, but to put people in their place and to gain confidence within himself. He is definitely charismatic in the diary room, in his own way, and of course he had his meltdowns too, which production definitely exploited. At 14th is Will from Big Brother 7, who has a diary room average of 8.19. Not shocked at all that he ended up being on here, but I think he isn't higher because even by the time of Big Brother 7, they were slowly starting to cut down on the amount of diary rooms. Also, there are many other people in the season who are proven to be great at diary rooms and deserve to have narration and screen time as well. While Will was TV ready and performative in his first season, he definitely amped it up here, especially when he was with Mike Bookie, who wanted to make a huge impression as well after being an early flop on his original season, and they did a lot of diary rooms together, clearly hamming it up. While he was definitely playing the game more aggressively this time, hence getting a lot of the game-centered focus, a lot of the scenarios he would set up for himself and the antics in the house was to solely make good TV and to get more screen time. He wasn't yelling at the TV like many other people in the diary room, and he was the sole winner of a season within the season, so of course that was going to be a focus, especially if he could pull out another win. At 13th is Paul from Big Brother 19, who has a diary room average of 8.31. Big Brother 19 was essentially the Paul show, and there has never been any other season in Big Brother history that was more singular to one particular house guest than Big Brother 19 is to Paul. Essentially, with Paul being the only returnee house guest, and there being twists that cater to Paul, it put Paul in a position to completely take over the season, and literally everything went through Paul. How the HOH competitions turned out, how the other competitions turned out, who would be evicted, who would be fighting with who, what they would be fighting about, so on and so forth. From the very beginning to the very end, it was the Paul show, and I don't even think that Derek, Dr. Will, Dan, Danielle, or any of the others had that presence. I think Paul is so low because Big Brother 19 did not come out in a time where there were a lot of diary rooms being given. So while he had a lot of diary room distribution heavily in his favor, the amount of diary rooms in the season were just a lot less compared to other seasons. At 12th is G from Big Brother 4, who has a diary room average of 8.65. From here on out, you're going to see many people here who are solely on this list because they hugely benefited from being on an older season, where they got a lot of diary rooms. And if they were not on an early BB season, like a very early BB season, they wouldn't normally be on the list. G is the epitome of this, in my opinion, since I feel like most of his content was not only because it was circumstantial, but he was allowed to develop more through diary rooms just due to being on an early season. G did win two HOHs in the season, so he got increased narration due to that, was nominated a few times, and was the most capable out of the underdog alliance that he was a part of. 
G himself spoke in a very monotonous tone that kind of made it hard to pay attention to him for the longest period of time, and he just was not interesting in any way. It was nice to see an Asian man on TV who was proud of his race, ethnicity, heritage, and discussed it at length during the show and season. At 11th is Erica from Big Brother 4, who has a diary room average of 9.17. Erica is another person who I believe is on this list mainly because of the season she was on, with Big Brother 4 having a lot of diary rooms. And I know this to be a fact because in Big Brother 7, which generally has less diary rooms, but when she was on a cast with a bunch of people who were bona fide stars on television and in the diary room, she didn't get a lot of focus, and camera time. Erica was nominated a few times in the season, so she got some content in the season as a result of that, and did win one HOH. We also heard about how her bad relationship with Robert affected her, and how her interactions with Jack meant a lot to her, since she didn't have a relationship with her father. She was not very captivating or entertaining throughout the season, but I do think she was one of the most vulnerable, and that's helped her in a season that was in an era of casting twists. At 10th is Jason from Big Brother 3, who has a diary room average of 9.23. While I like Jason, I do believe that he is only on this list because of the season he was on, and that was one of the seasons with the most diary rooms in general. Jason is charming, but it's usually not in the type of charm that shows up or would fit in the diary room from production's lens, where he is given a lot of strategic and comedic insight. I remember them pushing a lot about his virginity through the diary room on the episodes and how he felt about the woman on the cast. We got to see him develop, and he did explain his more devious side relating to how he played the game, and that was nice. Jason is not boring whatsoever, but he also isn't one of the more exciting or riveting people in the show, to be completely honest, and to be the 10th most visible endgamer. Either way, he is still very likable and helped make the season great. At 9th is Robert from Big Brother 4, who has a diary room average of 9.26. I wasn't expecting Robert to be this high on the list. It is interesting, since he isn't really discussed that much, even relating to the people who were on his season, or on this era of Big Brother. But when you look at the season, it does kind of make sense as to why he is this high. Outside of him placing third, especially during a time where every single eviction of the season would take place in each week, and there were no fast forwards yet, he was a part of the twist of the season, with it being the exes, and he and Erica were the last exes who remained in the game. We actually got a lot of content from him, pertaining his relationship with his daughter, which was discussed heavily, his alcoholism was discussed, and of course we got his relationship with Erica, which ended due to his infidelity. At 8th is Lisa from Big Brother 3, who has a diary room average of 9.34. A lot of what I said about Jason applies to Lisa as well, in my opinion. She isn't boring and is a good enough speaker, but she isn't the most captivating or interesting person to be on Big Brother. And I do think that she's this high because of the season she was in, just like Jason. Lisa was visible from the very beginning to the very end, especially since she won the first and last HOHs, so she had her moment in controlling the narrative of the season. We saw Lisa rise and fall regarding her showmance, making the tough choice to not bring Eric back in the game, being pushed out of her alliance when they were forced to turn on one another, and to learn from Danielle's teaching, and ending up surpassing Danielle. At 7th is Amy from Big Brother 3, who has a diary room average of 9.46. I know I've said this quite a bit, but I truly think that Amy is arguably the most unique person in Big Brother USA, and there is no one who has been cast before or after her who is like her. Not only was Amy one of the few people who have been nominated in almost every single week she was present for in the season, while lasting a majority of the season, but she really bared no bones about her insecurities, flaws, and vulnerabilities, as well as her arrogance at times, not only with just the game, but in her overall life in general. 
We saw the drama that she had with the cast at times, and we also saw what the cast perceives to be alcoholism as well, with it contributing to a lot of issues with her for a lot of people. Amy knew how to make a joke and to throw shade in the diary room, while being a great, funny narrator and explaining herself really well. Amy had a lot of charm, and I completely get why she's this high on the list. At 6th is Nicole from Big Brother 2, who has a diary room average of 9.73. She is so underrated and hasn't been giving her credits pertaining to helping make Big Brother USA what it is, and I do think she is one of the more interesting journeys in the baby house ever. Nicole was a recently married woman who was just being herself, which is loud, boisterous, and initially friendly, but willing to get to know people and to play the game. But she was massacred by most of the house from the very beginning and had to change her behavior and ego to make sure she stayed in the house. We do see Nicole make some strong bonds with people like Hardy, Bunky, Krista, and eventually Will, so seeing that evolution of those relationships were great. Nicole was always so expressive and charming in her own way during the diary room. And she could throw shade in an undercutting way, though she would also go on these great rants in the diary room and in person too. She becomes the villain about halfway through the season, and you can tell that she kind of ceases, but just refuses to own it. And of course there was Gate, which caused her to be more emotional for the rest of the season, as she believed that her marriage was in danger. At 5th is June from Big Brother 4, who has a diary room average of 10.4. When it comes to the diary rooms, I think June is one of the queens of it, and she's underrated in this element. She never raises her voice, and you can tell that she's not trying her best to be the funniest person in the room. She just is, and whatever comes out of her mouth is sheer gold. She has a cadence with what she says, what she narrates, and how she narrates it. Of course, with it being a more personal season, she got a lot of diary rooms to elaborate on her relationship with G and how it crumbled. We do see her become the face of the quote-unquote liberal woman or whatever you want to call it. And she also talks about how she did not become very traditional, pertaining her Asian heritage as well. She narrated quite a bit of the strategy in the season, and we understand all of her choices very well. I think the best quality about June is how she pokes fun of herself and she goes in on herself just as much as she goes in on everyone else, where most people in Big Brother don't do that and take themselves too seriously as well, whether they're just very seriously or they're too serious with trying to be funny in the diary room and it just never works out. At fourth is Will from Big Brother 2, who has a diary room average of 10.8. I was expecting him to be relatively close to the top of the list, but I did think you'd get a bit higher than fourth on the list. When you really look at it, Will did most of his campaigning and a lot of his gameplay in the diary room, especially since the evicted jurors will be able to watch or was able to watch the episodes. Here is where he would make his competitors look worse while he could claim that he was more honest with his deceitfulness and would campaign to the jury as to why he would win. Though, when detailing or dealing with the house guests in real time, he would act the opposite and would never say anything to their faces that he said to them in the diary room. Of course, he was very charismatic and used that to his advantage, especially when it came to the somewhat self-producing his own arc of the house, or within the house. It also helped that he was relatively open and very funny, where the others either weren't naturally funny or they were funny due to their lack of self-awareness, and it was the editors and others making fun of them. He was a great character, and the producers definitely exploited him as much as they could. So, we have a two-way tie for second and third, with the two people being Marcellus and Allison, the former from Big Brother 3, the latter from Big Brother 4, who both have a diary room average of 11. I knew that they both were going to be very high, but I didn't expect either of them to be high enough to be on the podium. Marcellus was someone who has never been on Big Brother before, since while there were gay people on the show before, no one was like Marcellus. He came in the house and was targeted by the house guests just for being himself, in addition to some 
probable implicit biases that the others had of him being a black and a gay man. We got a lot of content from him about this, and that pushed him to be at the forefront pertaining the narration of the season from the very beginning. He was saved, would win quite a bit of competitions, so he did control who went home on his HOHs, and was nominated a few times, while getting into drama here and there. We saw how he interacted with everyone, and seeing how real life played into a lot of his dynamics and decisions. Marcellus was an open book the entire time, and was funny as hell, even without trying to be. He had to get into the strategy of the season, gave us a lot of personal content, and content about his backstory, and how one of the greatest falls in Big Brother history. Allison came into her own being a train wreck, as she had the most obnoxious reaction to her ex being in the house, though we now know that there was a chance that she and Justin knew about the twist of Hedda's time when they entered the season. She knew that something bad was going to happen in the house, and apologized to her boyfriend at the time about what would happen. You would see the love slash lust square that happened between her, Justin, Dana, and Nathan, which put her in a very dangerous spot, and she was always open about her feelings, and got her in the drama that happened in that season. After all that came to pass, Allison learned how to become a floater and use the diary room as therapy sessions, whether she was ranting about the other house guests, freaking out about something, or delivering what her strategy was, as she was kind of creating what a floater was at the time. Seeing a woman so ruthless on the show was so interesting to watch, whether you liked her or not. So at first is Danielle from Big Brother 3, who has a diary room average of 12.1. Looks like the queen stays on top. I have made it clear that she is the queen of diary rooms, so to see her be the most visible end gamer is not shocking to me whatsoever. Though I thought there would be someone or a few people who would challenge it. Danielle came into the game wanting to win the money and would do anything to get the prize money. We learn more about her backstory with her becoming a teen mother very early on in her life and never really having the chance to enjoy her adolescence or young adulthood like many people who are that age. She found a bond with Jason and several others in the house and seeing her struggle with not only making strategic connections with people but then having to cut some of those relationships which were very personal relationships as well as they went on was great to watch. She got control in the fourth week and it became the Danielle show, pertaining who stays and who goes. She lets it rip in the diary room, whether it was her being emotional, her ranting about her house guests, or giving great strategic insights that no one up to that point had come up with, though it was due to her own detriment. Truly three-dimensional, and it was the diary rooms that helped us see all three of those dimensions. Okay, so that is my list. Technically not even my list, it's just a bunch of stats about who were the most visible end gamers using the diary rooms. Some of this was shocking, some of it really wasn't. There was a lot of emphasis on the older seasons, like Big Brother 2 to Big Brother 4, especially because from Big Brother 5 onwards, they started decreasing the amount of diary rooms quite a bit, and then by the time of BB8, it completely depleted. So that's why there's a huge emphasis on the older seasons. Thank you all for watching, and I'll come back with part two pertaining to least visible and gamers next. And I will correct what I made in the last video pertaining some of the mistakes and talk about it there in the next one. Thank you. Have a nice day.